It is good to be here again. Is this thing connecting? Sounds like it, maybe? Okay. And today is Father's Day, and I noticed that uh, Crystal had picked at least one song that was very appropriate for Father's Day, because it said in the bottom corner there, written by 10,000 fathers. (laughs) Can you imagine even two of them agreeing exactly how the song should sound, let alone (laughs) 10,000? Yeah, yeah. But it is Father's Day. And I'm not going to talk specifically about Father's Day, because when I grew up, or as a teenager, my memory at least, rightly or wrongly, on Mother's Day, the pastor would talk about mothers and how wonderful they were. Like, mothers were absolutely saints. They had halos over their heads. And on Father's Day... Well, fathers are a bunch of schmucks. That's the impression I got. I mean, it was men preaching, so what are they going to say? Women are not right? Of course. And, and what are they going to say? Men are great? Because it sounds a little too self-serving. Father's Day. But I want to talk a little more about relationships, kingdom relationships specifically. When I think of relationships, I have an image in my mind of a father playing catch with a child, daughter or son, doesn't really matter. I have four sons and I have one daughter and I played catch more so with the older three than the younger two, but with all of them. So here's the dad and the child in your own mind, pick an age. And he gives his daughter the glove and says, okay, I'm going to throw the ball to you and you catch it. And she's not sure how to hold the glove or the son isn't sure how to hold the glove and the dad tosses the ball and the glove stays right there and the ball just rolls on by. And... The child looks at the dad like, I thought we were playing catch. Why didn't you hit the glove? (laughs) Or the dad says, come on, how could you not catch that? Because in his mind, it's not that complicated. But a child who has never played catch before doesn't know you're supposed to move the glove to where the ball. You're supposed to anticipate where this ball is going to go. Or the dad throws too hard. Or the child happens to just be watching something else at the moment and gets bonked on the top of the head. Or something like that. Maybe you've been part of something like that, either as the dad or as the child on the receiving end. And it's just not working right. Relationships. Throwing, missing, not paying attention, Or maybe the image is better, a young husband brings his wife flowers. And he's going to really impress her today. Maybe it's a special day, maybe it's an anniversary, I don't know. So he goes all out and he brings two dozen red roses. Like how much better can it be than that? The fact that he picked them up at Costco is immaterial. (laughs) And he's wondering why she is not absolutely overjoyed and thrilled with receiving these two dozen red roses. I mean, she kind of says thank you, but... She doesn't actually like red roses. I would like to do a survey someday. I won't do it here, so don't bother raising hands. How many women actually like red roses? I... I don't know of very many who really do. Yeah. My wife, if it's roses, well, they should be yellow or peach or something else. Um, A daughter-in-law has a whole different flower that's a favorite. Of just the few conversations I've had, I'm not sure how many women actually like, and, and this is supposed to be the ultimate romantic gift, isn't it? Apparently it's not. 
So he brings these roses and wonders what's the matter with her. Why isn't she impressed? I thought I did everything right. I thought I threw the ball exactly where it should go and she totally missed it. Kingdom relationships. We have these relationships in our lives, all of us, some kind of relationships. And we far too often miss the mark or don't pay attention when something is being thrown at us or just, we just get, get it wrong or, or it's an issue of being in control. Who's in control right now and who has to give in to who and all that relationships. So kingdom, just the word kingdom, first of all, the word kingdom is used often in the New Testament. John the Baptist says in Matthew chapter two, verse, Matthew chapter three, verse two, he starts his preaching and he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Okay. Kingdom of heaven. Well, kingdoms give the impression of armies and thrones and power and control and all of that. Jesus started preaching. He says in Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, after John had been put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, he taught his disciples to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And over and over and over. Uh, chapter 10 in Matthew, Jesus sends his disciples out and he says, As you go, preach this message the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, is near. Kingdom. When Jesus talks about kingdom, or John the Baptist talks about kingdom, it's kind of hard to tell. Is he talking about something like when he says near, does he mean literally near? Or does he mean like, over 2,000 years in the future. And he's just pretending it's near. What does he mean with near? Or imminent? Or different words like that. What is this kingdom? And sometimes theologians have made it way more complicated than it needs to be. So I'm going to try a definition of kingdom. Kingdom of God. That place where God is king. Forgive me for not being a theologian and making it more complicated. If it were a geographical region, if the kingdom of God came to Saskatchewan, then in Saskatchewan, God would be king. Everybody in Saskatchewan would, would know, Saskatchewan would know what God wants, and they would do what he wants. It would be really simple. God would be king in this province. If it were somebody's heart then God is king in that heart. That heart knows what God wants and does what God wants. If it were a relationship between two people, if it were a kingdom relationship, then God is king in that relationship. And those two people know what God wants in that relationship, and they do what God wants in that relationship. Kingdom, very simply, maybe too simple. But all the longer ones leave me confused. So when Jesus talks about kingdom, he's talking about both present and future. There is a time coming when all creation will submit to the kingdom of God, to his rulership. That's coming. There will be no option. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But that hasn't happened yet. So that's why I asked earlier when Jesus was saying the kingdom of God is near, is he talking, pretending it's near, but it's actually over 2,000 years in the future? Just 
leading his people along? I don't think so. That's not how he operates. It is future. But if we allow God to be king in our hearts, then the kingdom of God has come into our hearts. The king, kingdom is that place where God is king. So Jesus isn't just talking about something we wait for. We do wait for that literal, full, complete kingdom. But he said it's near. He says, repent and believe the good news. Somehow in those early times, he always attaches repent and welcoming the kingdom. It's like we got to let something go to let God's kingdom become part of us. The kingdom of God is alive in those people who willingly submit to God. The kingdom of God is alive in relationships of people who willingly give that relationship to God. So when I talk about the kingdom, I'm talking about that place where God is king, where God is completely in charge, where God makes the rules. So kingdom relationships demonstrated. When you think about a kingdom relationship, what comes to mind? You think of any person you know of? Maybe you do. My example, in John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. What do you mean by that? You're the same person? Or, or what? I mean, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, when, when Jesus is baptized and he comes out of the water, here's Jesus, the Son of God, coming out of the water, and he sees the Spirit descending on him like a dove, so that's the Spirit of God. And then the voice from heaven says, this is my Son. All three were there. All different, doing different things. So what does Jesus mean when he says, I and the Father are one? What if it means that they are so totally united in their love for each other and in their purpose that they know exactly what the other is going to do? There's no competition to see who's in charge. There's no record keeping, well, you won last time, so today I'm going to, you know. They just totally agree. They have the same goals. See, as humans, we think in terms of hierarchy. So who's in charge here? Chains of command, power and control. And I have been in discussions where we're trying to figure out, okay, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God. So, so God the Father is the one who's actually in charge. And I think back to those discussions now and I blush a little bit at our immaturity because it's not an issue of chains of command. It's not about who's in charge. I think Adam and Eve had a kingdom relationship in the garden. Complete openness, complete trust, complete unity. Imagine what that would be like. Of course, I don't think that lasted more than a few hours. I mean, we have no idea how far it went from creation till they chose to eat from that tree. But after that, After their first sin, God says to Adam, what have you done? What did Adam do? He blamed Eve and he blamed God. This woman whom you gave me. It's actually not my fault, God. It's hers and yours. Eve, what have you done? Oh, the serpent tricked me. They were blaming each other. The unity was broken. And God says, among other things, he says to Eve, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And there's lots of different ways of spinning what that all means. But one thing is clear as a result of sin, the perfect unity that Adam and Eve had was ruined. 
From there on, it was, who's in charge? Who's, who's winning this time? I don't want to do what you, you know. For humanity in general, from that point on, that's been our struggle. A clash of wills and a disagreement on goals. So think about your relationships, the ones you're involved in. Maybe it's friendship relationships, maybe it's marriage relationships, maybe it's parent-child relationships, maybe it's worker and, and boss relationships or whatever. What kind of relationships are they? How are they going? Think about marriage relationships. Most young couples, when they approach marriage, are pretty sure they will have a kingdom relationship, although they don't use the word. Somehow they are convinced they will sail off into the future and everything will be good. They will be united in purpose and goals. So the pastor asked them, so how are you going to make your decisions? Oh, we'll do it together. Right? What if you disagree? Ah, we'll work through it. It'll be good. Will one of you be more in charge than the other? Uh, Well, you know... And then if they're a Bible-believing couple, then they say, well, it does say in the Bible that the husband should kind of take leadership. So, uh, yeah, I guess he'll be more in charge. And my question is, how's that working? Ephesians 5 says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Colossians 3 says very similar things. What could be more clear than that? The husband is in charge, and the wife should do what he says. Mm. It really works. Pardon? It really works. It really works, I tell you. We, we, because of our brokenness, because of what Adam and Eve started, we think in terms of power and control. Who's in charge? Somebody has to be in charge, right? Who's the boss? Who has the final say? And good Bible-believing churches across North America are littered with marriages, even though they would never consider divorce, are a mess because of the question of who's in charge, constantly back and forth. It was not a question who's in charge, was not a question until the first sin. Therefore, the language of chain of command, power, and control is also a result of that first sin. If Adam and Eve had never sinned, there would be no need to figure out who's the boss here because they would have harmony. What if that was our goal in all of our relationships? Dads, moms, children, workers, whatever. Instead of power and control, we would seek to hear each other's heart. What if that young husband who brings his wife these red roses would have taken the time to hear what her favorite flower is, first of all? Maybe. What if she would see the sparkle in his eye and accept the roses, even though she doesn't really like red roses, but accept them as what he is meaning with it. It's a good gift. It's something he wants to to bless her with. What if we would hear each other's hearts just to start? Sometimes... Going back to Ephesians 5, that, those verses there that I read about wives, submit to your husbands and all that. What if we would read the verse that starts that whole section? And I will go there so that I don't misquote it. The verse that starts that section is, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he goes into the wives and the husbands and the differences between them. Submit to each other. I think he is saying, this is your goal, to be like a kingdom relationship, a a relationship where God is in control. It's not about the two of you. 
where submission is equal on both sides. If we keep that verse in mind, then we can reread the other verses and hear about the husbands and the wives not describing power and control, but rather describing differences in roles. You do this, you do that, but it's not about who's up here and who's down there. It's different. It changes it. What about if in all of our relationships, kingdom relationships were the goal, to have a kingdom relationship? We are all fallen creatures. We are all broken. You know you are broken. Give the person beside you the freedom to also be broken. What if when you're playing catch, tossing the ball back and forth, and you could so much understand each other that you know exactly where the ball is coming, and you know exactly where to throw it, because you're one in purpose and goals. So think about what relationships would look like if they were truly grounded in the kingdom of God. If God was truly king in those relationships, if God was making the rules in those relationships, when you spend time together, when you get frustrated with each other, when you're trying to decide if the paint should be green or blue or whatever, keep working, work at keeping God as king in your relationships. When you're tossing that ball, and it can be that physical ball, it can be just the ball of the relationship, throwing it back and forth at each other. What if it's a common goal? The guy who throws it really wants the other one to catch it. The one who catches whatever, you know the image, to be one in that relationship to be one the way Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Different people, doing different things in different places, but one in their relationship. Jesus said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And may that be our prayer, that his kingdom will be in our hearts and in our relationships. And we know the time is coming when it will also be, not just in Saskatchewan, but in our world. God's kingdom. And may God bless you.